Okay, so in this video, we'll go through all the steps of muscle contraction. If you look on your Canvas site, there will be a page that says like steps of muscle contraction study resource. I highly recommend printing that out and being able to write out all the steps of muscle contraction on your own. These two videos are excellent. Um, I'm not sure the link is necessarily working, um, but if you Google muscle contraction videos, there should be one towards the beginning from McGraw-Hill that's good. Um, otherwise, feel free to message me and we can find you another video to watch if you can't get either one of these to work. Okay, so the idea of muscle contraction is based on this theory of sliding filaments. So, like we described previously, there are thick and thin filaments and, well, the sarcomere is shortening because the two filaments are sliding against each other. The individual myofilaments aren't actually shortening, so they slide against each other. In muscle contraction and relaxation, there are four primary steps, and each step kind of has its own little pieces to it. So first is excitation, and this is the nervous system part. Step two is excitation contraction coupling. This is how we connect the nervous system to the muscular system. Contraction is the actual shortening of the muscle fiber, not the filaments. Um, and then relaxation is returning back to normal. So in step one, excitation, what happens is the nerve signal, the action potential, causes these voltage-gated calcium channels to open. Calcium rushes in, and that triggers the release of acetylcholine. So then neurotransmitter gets released into the synaptic cleft here. And then steps three and four, the acetylcholine comes in, binds to the acetylcholine receptor on the muscle, and this causes a change in shape. It opens sodium and potassium exchange, and this results in a local potential. So kind of like an action potential, just a little bit smaller. Step five, um, this causes the um, voltage-gated channels to open and that causes action potentials to travel along the sarcolemma or the muscle cell membrane. In the general step two, we have excitation contraction coupling and this is how we link the muscle action potentials to the actual release of calcium. So remember, the transverse tubules, the T-tubules, are extensions of the sarcolemma, the plasma membrane, and they go deep into the cell, and that allows um, the signal to continue deep into the muscle. So if you remember, the sarcoplasmic reticulum holds that calcium, this is super, super important because the calcium release is what will allow the troponin to move out of the way, and I'll go through that in just one second. So, excitation, contraction, coupling. So, step six, the action potentials. This little yellow dotted line travels down into the T-tubules, and that action potential causes calcium to be released into the um, sarcoplasm or the muscle cell cytoplasm. From there, once there's a bunch of calcium released, it will find its way over here to troponin. Calcium will bind to troponin and that will shift everything out of the way. So the ropes, the tropomyosin, shifts out of the way. And then you can see these little divots and those are the active sites on actin. These little divots are what the myosin heads desperately want to bind to. So contraction, the third main step, what happens is the myosin heads will come in and they will bind to the um, active site on the actin. So first what they do is they activate so they have an ATP bound to them, they use the ATP, they hydrolyze it, and that extends the myosin head out, so it's stretching, and it reaches to grab the actin, and it will grab the actin, and then it will form what we call a myosin-actin cross bridge, 
where the two proteins are actually linked together. Then what happens is a new ATP comes and it binds and that causes the um, power stroke to happen. So this is where the myosin head is pulling against it and this causes the two to um, slide against each other. A new ATP will bind, it will let go, hydrolyze, grab, pull, bind a new ATP, hydrolyze, grab, pull, and it continues on. So here's another picture. You can see the um, myosin heads here, um, the tropo tropomyosin rope, the troponin yellow dots, and then the actin little turquoise balls here. Once the tropomyosin moves out of the way, that exposes the binding site for the myosin to bind to the actin here. So the power stroke, the actual movement, happens in a few steps. So step number one, ATP binds to the myosin head, which causes dissociation from the actin. And then the tightly bound ATP is hydrolyzed, and then it changes shape, and the it stays with the ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and the phosphate are still there. Um, and then myosin head attaches to actin filament, and that releases that extra phosphate. The phosphate release triggers the power stroke, which is a conformational or shape change in the myosin head that causes it to pull against. In order to relax, for the myosin and the actin to relax from each other, we need ATP. So this is very counterintuitive. We need ATP to relax. A little counterintuitive. So myosin ATPase, like we talked about on the myosin head, there's a site for ATP to bind and there's this ATP ACE enzyme. And this is what breaks ATP into ADP and an inorganic phosphate. When we break bonds, we release energy, and that energy is what is used to actually move um, the muscle filaments. So calcium allows the exposure of the mining sites, so that allows the power stroke to happen. New ATP binds the myosin. Um, if there's no ATP, we can't relax. If there's no ATP and free calcium, we end up with something called rigor mortis that I'll go through later on in the lecture. But this is what happens after individuals pass away. They're no longer creating any ATP, but their sarcoplasmic reticulum is degrading, so they're releasing a bunch of calcium. And this causes muscle contraction in someone who is dead. And that's what we call rigor mortis. Their muscles get very um, contracted. And I'll go through that explanation a little bit later. So this is a microscope picture of the myosin head here binding to the actin. And it will pull, release, stretch out, grab, pull, release, stretch out, grab, and it continues. I highly recommend watching a video on this because it's a lot easier to understand if you're actually watching it happen. All right, this is another picture, same idea. So each contraction shortens muscle by about 1%. So each myosin head can do about five strokes. So five grab, pull, release, grab, pull, release per second, and each cycle uses one molecule of ATP. Skeletal muscle can only shorten about 40%, so how long does it take a muscle to reach full contraction? So it's about eight seconds, so 40 divided by five is about eight seconds. Last step here is relaxation. So first thing that happens, the nervous signal needs to stop. Acetylcholine will stop being released, and then this pac -Man enzyme acetylcholinesterase will degrade any remaining acetylcholine and that will stop any potentials from happening here along the plasma membrane. Calcium gets pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. There are little tiny pumps along here that are 
constantly pumping. However, when there is an action potential that comes in and tells the calcium to be released, that is way more powerful than the tiny little pumps pumping calcium back in. So calcium gets pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and that will eventually cause the troponin to shift the tropomyosin back over the um, active sites and then the actin and the myosin can no longer bind to each other. So that returns it back to its resting length. Okay. Again, I highly recommend watching a video. I will post a few on an announcement. I highly recommend looking at the worksheet that you see on your Canvas site that's labeled like study resource steps of muscle contraction. On your exam, you will more than likely be asked to write out all the steps of muscle contraction. Okay.